All right, and we're recording. So folks, welcome in. Uh, thanks for joining us today for our Service Fabric Community Q&A number 59. Uh, we have Charles, Mike, Sukanya, and many others joining uh, with us today, as well as our new ACP team admin, uh, Majela Evans. A quick reminder that this call is being recorded. We will share the recording afterwards um, on the team's YouTube channel, as well as the Azure Connection Programs um, webcast calendar. Um, we will monitor the chat for any questions or comments, so keep them coming throughout the session. Um, and if nothing else, Charles, go ahead and get us started. All right, let me share my screen. Can everyone see this? Looks good. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining and thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm going to be talking about a new service um, that is a member of uh, some open source service fabric observability tools. Um, it's called Fabric Healer. Um, but I can't talk about Fabric Healer first without first talking about really quickly Fabric Observer. As I mentioned, these are open source tools. Some of you, hopefully most of you, have heard about Service Fabric Observer. It's now in version three. Um, this is a uh, watchdog service that uh, works on Windows and Linux. Um, and its whole goal is to monitor specifically resource usage um, of your application services, your application service processes specifically, um, the health of the disks, the attached disks with respect to disk space um, and queue time waits. Uh, Node Observer is an observer that will monitor virtual machine health in the sense of, you know, memory use, ports, uh, Linux file handles, um, and also for apps, uh, which is I think most important for customers, is your code, your services, right? And so App Observer will monitor the, you know, ephemeral ports in use by these service processes, memory, so private working set, CPU usage threads, um, file handles. Um, uh, those are typically quite interesting, particularly ephemeral ports. Um, and so essentially what happens is you configure Fabric Observer to monitor your applications. Um, this can be done in you know, very simple ways, uh, like for the demo today. This configuration basically says for every user app on the node, because Fabric Observer runs on every node in a cluster, so it's a minus one stateless service, singleton. So this type of syntax or expression target app with a star means I, I, this is going to be valid for every service process running on the machine and only user services. So App Observer doesn't monitor or care about system services. This is your code, this is your stuff. And so you can set thresholds like this. Um, warning thread count came recently. It's actually can also be quite useful. If you're eating 500 threads, you definitely have problems. Um, the, uh, so this will, when this runs in your cluster, and it should, like if you have a service driver cluster and you don't already have your own watchdogs, it's highly recommended that you would use something like Fabric Observer. Um, Fabric Observer also affords you uh, the luxury of writing your own observers without having to clone the source code. It has a plugin model, which is very easy to use. Um, and so you could write your own observer that does something that's really specific to your own uh, workloads. So here we have a watchdog service. <clears throat> its only job is to, you ask it to monitor a, a, a metric, uh, you give it a threshold, the threshold is breached, so it's reached or, or, or passed. Um, it then will put that entity into a warning state it also can be configured to emit telemetry to your log analytics or your application insights uh, database or workspace. Um, 
And so you can then build your sort of alerting pipeline and wake someone up to, to kind of mitigate the problem. In the case where, let's say, you you're, have a service process that is leaking ports, it's eating too many ports. Um, and that's a problem in the ephemeral range because you only have a given number of them for the virtual machine. And so if you start just consuming all of the available ephemeral ports, you're going to break networking. You're not going to be able to create connections. Everybody is going to be unhappy. And so the way that you solve that problem is you would say, OK, I'm going to go in, I'm going to RDP the virtual machine, I'm going to kill the process, right? Windows will free or Linux will free those 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 connections, ports become available, problem solved. Then, of course, you have to figure out why are you leaking ports? And that can take some time to figure that out, depending upon uh, you know, your application. Sometimes it's not trivial to understand why that's happening. Um, so now we move into the next logical step from being able to detect, so configure, detect, and uh, effectively report to a world where we can heal uh, temporary. And this is something I think is really important to understand. The, the main point of something like an auto mitigation service is that it's a stopgap from getting you maintaining a greenness in the cluster while you asynchronously are fixing your bugs. That's, that's the way to think about it. It's not something that should always be healing. Because if it is, then it means there's some fundamental problem with the implementation of what it's fixing or attempting to at least mitigate. It's not fixing it, it's just mitigating the side effect of the problem. But the goal for you is to be able to say, OK, we're going to keep things green and we're going to figure out our bugs. Like that's that's the way to think about an auto mitigation service. It's not something like that should always be solving problems, right? So. Today, we're going to focus not on this, but I have to tell you about this because I think you should be using it. And secondly, you can't use this if you don't have this. And the reason uh, that that's the case um, is that Fabric Healer understands what Fabric Observer produces. So what Fabric Observer produces when it generates a warning, let's use the port example. When it generates that warning in, uh, on the node, because both of these are minus one singleton stateless services. When it generates the warning for uh, one of these service processes on node foo, it creates a, uh, a special sort of description in the health event, which is in fact a serialized instance of a type of a class that both of these code bases understand. And so Fabric Observer will serialize the information, Fabric Healer will deserialize it and use that concrete type throughout its own workflow. And the way that you're able to describe what you want Fabric Healer to do in the case where Fabric Observer emits one of these uh, understandable warnings <clears throat> is in a prologue-like uh, logic syntax so i'm not sure how many of you out there are aware of logic programming or prolog um i guess you could hand wave if you are um the the key is that you and i want to i want to be clear about this you don't have to be a logic programmer to use fabric healer that that's not the goal um and so what I want to do right away, since I've been talking about the port stuff, is let's take a look at what um, one of these logic rules look like. So what you're looking at right now are the application level repair logic rules. And so in logic programming, the, the way to think about it is you have a goal, right? And then you have a sub rule or a sub goal. And so let's scroll down. And so to be clear, I want, I mean, now that you can see this, this ships with a bunch of rules already written. And so you don't have to construct your own right off the bat. You could just come in and do something like change the target 
app name, for example. So in this case, what this is saying is that if there's an app, so if Fabric Observer emits a warning, a ephemeral port warning, um, and the application entity that was put into warning is Fabric My App 42. Um, and the value, meaning the number of ports that were reported by Fabric Observer, I'm going to bind that to a variable, right? That's what that syntax means. So I can then take the value that, so Fabric Observer, this, this serialized instance of telemetry data that I was talking about, this, this type, that's going to fill the head. This is the head of the rule. This will be filled with data from Fabric Observer. And we can pull this data out with syntax like this, which is binding a value to an argument. We're creating a variable that we can use in the rule. And then I can say, well, is it greater than 5,000? If the answer is true, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the logic engine, the query engine, uh, the, the, and that's going to be Guan. I'm going to talk about that in a second. We'll then move to the next sub rule. And what's the next sub rule? It's something called time scoped restart code package. Um, and this is going to, this is an, I mean, without getting too much into the weeds, but it's important that we explain what this is. This looks like a function, doesn't it? Right. But this is an what is called an internal predicate, which means it's just something that exists in the context of this rule file. It doesn't have a backing implementation. And this is sort of a convenience thing uh, so that I didn't have to write the same thing over and over and over again. I just call this internal predicate, which takes a couple things. It takes just an int, and this is a time span. And this is basically going to say we can repair, try this mitigation five times in a five hour window, right? And so you could also say try it one time in a one hour window. It depends on what you want to do. And so if you come and look at the implementation of this, time scoped restart code package takes the count and the time that I just showed you. It then calls a what's what is it, an external predicate meaning this actually has backing implementation, which by the way, one of the great things about Guan, Guan is the general purpose logic programming library that's also in preview and available uh, in the NuGet.org gallery. It's a .NET standard library and it can run in any .NET application context. Um, in this case, it's being used for a very scoped domain and the scoped domain is uh, auto mitigation in a service fabric cluster and specifically auto mitigation in a service fabric cluster with data provided by fabric observer. And so I go and get the repair history to figure out how many times this has happened within a window. This returns uh, again, uh, these binded bound values, so repair count is it going to be greater than or equal to what was put in here, the five you saw above? If it was, then we're going to emit a message uh, that we're not going to do anything at this time, right? Because you've exceeded the max number of repairs within a specific time, blah, blah, blah. Now we get down here. This is where the, the fun happens. We actually get to the mitigation. Right, and the mitigation in this case, restart code package. Um, this is also called an external predicate, and so it has a backing implementation. And by the way, all of this is done in C sharp. Guan is a general purpose logic programming library written in C sharp, obviously. So we have the whole base class library at our disposal for writing um, external predicates. Um, what's important to understand is that there's a separation. So in Fabric Healer, you have this configuration as logic model, which is what we're looking at right here. And then you have the, the executor code, right? The, the auto mitigation executor code is Fabric Healer code. And that's going to be running in a different context. It's not related to the logic. Logic is informing what the workflow is going to be. 
Fabric Healer itself is going to be doing the work uh, of execution and orchestration of repairs through the repair manager. So I wanted to show you the logic first because this is going to be your default interaction. This is basically the UI um, for Fabric Healer with respect to uh, customers. In other words, you're going to be config. You're going to be writing code that looks like this, right? You're going to be writing logic rules that inform um, repair workflows. And already out of the box, there's a number of of uh, things that you are aware of. Um, restart code package, restart replica, restart node, restart VM. These are things that you already understand. Um, and I think what's also really critical here is that this is not just random, kill the process and move on. This is all orchestrated through the Service Fabric Repair Manager service. So when you look at a cluster, um, and you look in the system, uh, these are system services. The Repair Manager service, its main job is to orchestrate um, service fabric repairs. It doesn't do anything. In other words, it doesn't conduct, it doesn't execute repairs. It orchestrates them. It's a state machine. It also does safety checks. So you'll notice that when like there's a cluster upgrade, um, you'll notice that there's these things like um, preparing health state, re preparing health checks, restoring health checks, stuff like that. That's repair manager is ensuring that the whatever repair some executor has, at, has basically told it I'm going to do. So I'm going to create a repair task and I'm going to execute the repair and I'm going to move you through um, your orchestration workflow. And the first thing I'm going to you're going to do is approve my request to do this repair. Um, and so if I say I want health checks, then repair manager will do various health checks on the cluster to make sure it's safe to say, restart the code package for the service, right? And then it'll approve the job, move into the preparing state, and then it lets me know that I'm ready to move into execution. And since repair manager doesn't do the execution, the, exec the executor does, which is made explicit when you create the repair. Um, this is where Fabric Healer will then do the execution. And when it's done, it'll let Repair Manager know that it's done. It'll move it into the restoring state uh, and then we'll be complete. And so the, the reason I'm saying this is that any repair that Fabric Healer attempts to conduct is orchestrated through the Repair Manager with safety checks right? Depending upon the repair. So if it's a restart replica, or it could be a remove replica for a stateless service, that's fundamentally, there's not, there's no safety checks in those APIs themselves. A restart code package, which is a bit more heavy handed, does have a deactivation step. Um, so there are safety checks internal into that API. So if you look at the implementation of restart code package, there's a deactivation step. And so uh, it's not just kill the process, right? So that's important to understand. In some cases, it's fine to just restart a replica. So I, I'm not trying to scare you and say, don't use that. Um, it depends on what your service does. You could have a stateful service with a lot of state, and it could take time to rebuild replicas. So that's something to consider. Um, but moving on from there, I just wanted to be clear uh, that this is the orchestration engine for repairs. Um, and if you have a cluster where um, uh, you want to do VM level repairs, the infrastructure service has to be running because Fabric Healer doesn't do, doesn't reboot your VM, right? Uh, instead, it just creates a repair task of system.reboot, which informs the repair manager that infrastructure service and you'll supply like the, the executor is going to be infrastructure service of this node type. And the intent is to restart the virtual machine. 
So you give it this system dot reboot uh, is important as the action. And then repair manager will orchestrate the repair with the infrastructure service. And so again, that shows you that this isn't doing stuff outside the context of what um, uh, we already do today. Now, there are some differences with respect to rules like clearing out your disk space. Um, this also, you know, it's important to understand that um, a rule like this, this is purely fabricular, right? And so in this case, this is basically makes it easy to, if you are monitoring some folders um, and they exceed like some number that you provide, in this case, 50 gigabytes for, for the trace file. So for example, we do have cases where disk space, you know, we start filling up disk. Right. And if you fill up disk on an operating system, you basically make the VM useless. Right. We need a disk. Doesn't matter if it's Windows or Linux. And so you've all probably experienced cases where, you know, something's gone really wrong and then we're trying to figure out the problem. And it turns out, oh, yeah, there's no disk space available. And that kind of breaks everything. Um, and so you can basically use something like Fabricular to clean out specified. Um, folders uh, if they reach a certain limit, right? So that's just an example of something that the executor is purely fabricular. It's not calling any service fabric APIs. Um, it's just calling C sharp APIs. So going back to this one to not get too far ahead of, of ourselves, um, I wanted to quickly show um, Juan. Guan, uh, as I mentioned, is effectively um, a prologue like logic programming uh, system um, that you can use in any uh, .NET application where you want to have the power of logic programming. So you can express things as logic rules, and then Guan will parse and execute them. And the whole goal of a logic programming system is to give you an answer to get to some conclusion. And it does that by running through a set of, you know, you have a goal and then you have a set of sub goals and you're trying to get to an answer. And in the case of Fabric Healer, we're just trying to get to a repair action, right? That's the goal. If we can't get the repair action, that's fine. It means that the logic dictates um, that we're not going to restart the code package because you know whatever the sub rule is or whatever constraint we have actually wasn't true and so that's fine that's a fine answer it means we're not going to solve the problem it doesn't have to it hasn't reached the value that we're concerned about and so you can see you know there's a number of rules in here and the way that a logic programming system works is going to parse from top down and try to get an answer somehow. And so, you know, just to be clear, I know this might look kind of messy, but this is what a comment looks like because FH will parse all of this out because Guan doesn't know what this means. Like this has no meaning, right? So all of this stuff will be removed and Guan will just get a, a set of rules. Um, and so, this is to make it easy while you're in a rules file, you don't have to keep going back and forth to the documentation, then back to this. You can spend your time in here. It explains like, these are the things that are available in the head, right? These are the things that are available in the head. This is the information that's coming from Fabric Observer uh, in that ser in that now, in this DC in the serialized instance of the type that I mentioned, this is the stuff that gets deserialized in this context, and now we can grab what the app name was, the service name, the node name, the node type, the partition, et cetera, et cetera. These are the metric names that are supported for application level repairs. So we talked about ephemeral ports. You can also do all up TCP ports. This is not supported because there's really no, um, Today, there's no network related repair that I can help with in terms of if some endpoint is unreachable and we've used Network Observer, which is an observer that will occasionally go out 
and make sure you can access your SQL database or whatever downstream endpoints are important to you. And then memory, megabytes, memory percent, file handles, file handles percent, threads. Um, these are the things that you can, you know, get numeric values for, bind to variables that you can use in your rule, like we already did in the example that I showed, um, where we did exactly that. We took the, got the metric value, created an, an, an internal variable that we're using in the rule that we can then use in the sub rule. So the key here, and I hope this is clear because you're programmers, this is stuff you're used to seeing, right? There's nothing new here. You just have some new kind of interesting syntax, but the key and the, the, you know, this is scoped to a very specific domain with the goal of mitigating an issue. And the goal here, and also the head of the rule, which provides you access to a bunch of data that you can use in your sub rules to eventually get to this is the repair I want to do. Right. And so that's sort of how we use uh, Fabric Healer and Fabric Reserver together. They're complementary services. So now, if we go back to this cluster, I have this. Um, I'm actually going to leave beta. Uh, I like two seconds. Um, I do love the new SFX, by the way. I just like the refresh rate for this demo to be faster than five seconds. So I have an application on here called CPU stress. The only thing this thing does is it will eat a configurable amount of CPU. Um, I've configured Fabric Observer to warn when any of the services running on this machine that are user services uh, consume more than 15% CPU. <clears throat> in Fabric Healer, I have a rule for CPU specifically for this app that says if it eats more than 15, when you get the event health history, um, so this is something I shouldn't probably gloss over. <laughs> so get event health history. So let me explain why this part of the sub, why these sub rules are here. This is actually important. So as you can imagine, when you have a service like Fabric Observer, which does point in time um, observation, right? So all of the observers run in a sequential loop. So if you've enabled five observers, they're going to run in a sequential loop, one after the other. Um, and it could very well be that when App Observer was monitoring this application, um, it saw that, oh, it's crossed the threshold. I'm going to put it into warning. And then it comes back the next time it runs, and it's no longer an issue, right? So it's a transient problem. But let's say it happens three times in a 15 minute window, then you can say, well, you know, this seems to be an actual problem. Now I'm able to do this uh, in Fabric Healer um, in logic. Like I'm able to create this constraint, create this logic, uh, this configuration right in the rule itself, which I think is just, some, it's, this is what the innovation is in Fabric Healer. It's not restarting code packages. It's being able to describe what you want to have happen given the data supplied to the head of the rule from fabric observer which by the way you are the one who tells fabric observer what to do what to monitor when to warn so in fabric healer it's a natural experience to know that this stuff is coming from a service that you have configured to do specific things related to resource usage for entities that you care about like your services um, and then we can come in and construct, uh, you know, the world is our oyster. So in this case, I'm saying, look, if Fabric Observer has detected that this application, one of its service processes has exceeded 15% CPU usage, and I'm doing this for the purposes of this demo, um, I want to make sure that, you know, in the, if it's just happened once, I really don't want this rule to continue, right? Um, I only want this rule to continue if I've detected this uh, three times, right? At least three times. And so 
Fabric Healer is also running its loop, has a monitoring loop that looks for um, health events uh, on the node that it's running in the cluster, it's queries the cluster to get the set of health events for the target entity, which is like in this case is going to be application, could be deployed application. Um, and it's going to, if it detects that, oh, there's an issue, uh, it first then we'll go and see, okay, is this something that I understand? In other words, can I deserialize the description of this health event into a concrete type? And if the answer is no, then I'm not going to do anything because I don't really know what that could mean, right? You can see warnings in service fabric clusters where this application is not really going to know what to do. Like, and that's fine because there is nothing for it to do if hosting says this application is in warning because it doesn't have 100% um, quorum or 100% of the instances are available or we're rebuilding, we're reconfiguring, reconfiguration is taking longer than expected. These are things you, you understand as service fabric programmers. So this is a tightly controlled system and you own everything end to end from the type of information that gets put into your hands in the form of the head of the rule um, to the eventual outcome, the attempt to auto-mitigate the specific issue. So that's what this rule means. And at that point, we're going to run the time scope restart code package that I already showed you. <clears throat> so let's see if we can get this working. At this point, I need to come in here, <clears throat> excuse me, and restart this process. And this is also in fabric and service fabric, of course, is going to do its thing. It's going to bring the process back. And then the only thing this application does when it runs is it eats a configurable amount of working set or CPU, excuse me. Um, what we'll do now is we have this rule that I just showed you right here. We'll now run uh, Fabric Healer in the same cluster. And eventually, you will see this guy will be put into warning. And I'm going to actually leave it here because this is a debug build of this. So there'll be a lot of information that will be put out. So every time Fabric Observer runs, it has a sleep at the end of the sequential loop. Um, this would be much faster if I enabled um, uh, concurrent monitoring uh, for App Observer, which I highly recommend you do. It's available in 3.1.19, uh, 18 and 19. Um, it'll run much faster on capable hardware. Um, in this case, I'm not sure where we are in the sleep cycle. Um, and I know that it's not running concurrently on my dev machine because I don't have it configured that way. And this quick thing that I did. So let's wait for this to show up. While we're waiting on that, if you guys have yep. any questions uh, for Charles, please go ahead and unmute and ask the question. Is it um is it limited oh. is it limited to only hooking into the fabric observer or like for example could you like uh trigger uh some healing event like by hooking into like an external monitoring system like app insights or something like that that's a great question today the answer to that is no um the scoping it to um fabric observer <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> enables us to be very um constrained in other words from your perspective right um yeah this is just that i'm not running it as 
admin, that's fine. So basically, um, what's happening is because you own the initial uh, description of, so I put this into warning, which is what we just see now. I didn't have Fabric Reserver running, by the way. That's why we were sitting there waiting. Um, so it's detected this problem, right? And you told it to. <clears throat> Fabric Healer is then also going to detect the problem, right? So it's said it actually deserialized the information that was provided in the service of service in the Fabric Reserver uh, output. They speak the same language through this type, and so now. Um, what's going to happen is, as I showed you in that rule, remember I had that constraint that said it has to be three times, at least three times that this is detected. So at this point, the rule does not continue. It stops at the point that I showed you. Right? So it's doing what it has been asked to do. So if we come back here, we specifically said if it happens greater than three times, greater than or equal to three times in a 15 minute time window, go ahead and try the mitigation, right? So what's happening here is Fabric Observer is going to run every, so it, it happened and now we're waiting for RM to approve the repair task. Um, so the way that this works is every time Fabric Observer runs, it sees whether or not it's still in warning. And if it is, <laughs> it creates another health event, created at least three. That the rule then proceeded from that constraint that we just talked about into the call to time scoped uh, restart code package to that internal predicate, which then will eventually call the time the restart code package. Um, which is now, so now FH is prime. We've already, so we're done with the logic rule. We've gotten through the logic rule part of this. Fabric Healer has created the repair task. RM is now waiting to approve it. So it's, and when I, as, as you saw in this code, um, in the logic, I specifically say I want health checks. So now it's done its thing, right? Yay, it worked. All right. So the key here, um, the key takeaway is please experiment with this tool. It, it, it's, in, it's in preview. Um, it, it, it's safe by default. And what I mean by that, as I mentioned earlier, um, everything is orchestrated with Repair Manager. You can turn off health checks if you want. I mean, the irony is that let's say you told Fabric Observer to put an entity into error. <coughs> Excuse me. Guess what? That typically will mean that the repair job is not going to be approved. And so there are cases where you don't want to do a health check. But remember, you own you own these decisions and, and you own the code. Right, these are your services. You knew what you know what they do. You know if they're stateless or not. You know if they have a bunch of complex state or not, like a complex actor-based thing. You understand that. You wrote the code, so you can understand what you think, what you're comfortable with in terms of a mitigation to solve a problem that might be related to a bug in your code, or it could have been transient and something spun out of control, and so may, the the rule may never run again. But in most cases, the idea is that um, you use Fabric Healer uh, to, to protect your cluster while you're fixing your bugs. And so in that vein, um, the, the last thing I'll show you, since we only have so much time and you guys have definitely other things to talk about, um, is there's this concept of time. And so you could actually write a rule that says, um, you know, look, I want to run this mitigation only if 
it's earlier than a specified date, right? So the dev team is going to fix this bug by the 30th of November. In the meanwhile, before we get there, I mean, that's our target date. You'll be able to run this mini fabric healer. Go ahead and run this mitigation, right? While we're trying to figure out our bugs, time is something that returns daytime now, daytime UTC now. This just returns a daytime object. Looks familiar, doesn't it? And you pass in just a string that represents the date. And so we compare these two values. This is the beautiful thing about Guan, right? I actually added this to Guan. And because it's C sharp, you can imagine how simple that was. And so um, that on that vein, I just wanted to give you that quick little hint here. If you want to constrain how long some repair can run, you can do it using daytime logic. OK, so we saw the, um, the demo. And if we go back here, you'll also notice in my rule that I said time scope restart code package, and I gave it a one uh, and a one hour, which means only run this once within one hour. So guess what? All this app does is eat CPU. So if you restart it, guess what? It's just going to eat CPU again. And so this just shows the, um, the constraint working, uh, the logic working. So the logic works. And this output is only done in debug because you don't really need to know every single one of these steps. What you do need to know is this. So this kind of thing will come out in release build. Um, also this. So you'll see this and there'll be a delay and then there'll, there'll be this. Either it's successful or it's not successful. Um, and so that, with that, please use this. Um, Experiment with it, have fun in your test clusters. All of these are available. Uh, it's public open source software. You can get Service Fabric Observer at service. You can get it here. You can get this here. Guan, you can grab. Uh, all of these actually you can grab on NuGet. So um, I'm sure you're all aware of that by now. Um, uh, but the NuGet gallery, we have a Service Fabric app section. This has like cluster observer, fabric observer, and also fabric healer. Guan, which ships as a um, .NET standard library, all of these are Microsoft signed binaries and Microsoft signed NuPKGs if you're gonna use them. This one obviously you would use in that context because you're just going to consume this package in your C-sharp code, in your .NET application, and have fun with logic programming. This is an example of how you can use Guan um, as a configuration as logic uh, domain, which I think is the only, is the real innovation with Fabric Healer. And so, with that, if you have any questions, please ask. <laughs> All right. So um, thank you, Charles. This was a yeah. very well put together um, demo, and I think a lot of people are pretty keen on trying it out. Um, cool. So yeah, you guys can um, feel free to unmute and ask questions um, if you want to kind of play around with the product and come back and you know uh, chime in. You can always. Uh, there are a couple of links which are available where you can post your questions. You can post your questions on the GitHub link as well. Um, so there are many means to reach out and uh, uh, we'll be monitoring for any questions that you have following up on that. Um, and um, you can also just add it to the chat while we take it to the next step. So thank you again, Charles. Uh, really appreciate you putting this together. And no problem. Great. Um, so next I will hand it off to Mike. Mike, do you want to give an update and then we can Go to Q&A from there. Sounds good, Sakanya. So let me go ahead and give a quick update. Um, was going to tempt the live demo guys today, but I think I'm going to pass and quickly show a video along with my update. Let me get this on the screen. So hopefully this looks, starts to look familiar. I'm trying to provide a consistent update framework here for folks. I'm going to specifically talk about managed clusters. 
At the moment, um, we are, of course, improving the classic product too. Um, I'll share some more updates of that probably next month, just to kind of recap what we've done in the past few months. Um, but let's get into it. So, uh, sake of time, let me be pretty quick. Um, so, just to recap, and I can make this available offline. You know, we do have a long list of features, um, scenario support, and the GA release made available in May. But let's get into the updates real quick. So, and let me make this bigger for folks to see. So the one thing I've added here, this, this should be familiar if you've seen this before, um, bring on virtual network, bring on load balancer, IPv6 support, dual stack specifically here. The one thing I've added to this slide is auto scale. So we are and will be announcing official support for this in the preview in the same preview API here in the coming weeks, probably in the, I'm hoping in the next week, um, just depends on some internal timing. Uh, worst case, it may slip into the first week of November, um, but I've been actively using it. It works. Um, just waiting for some documentation stuff to be able to go live. Um, so this will specifically support um, Azure monitor based auto scaling. I want to quickly demo this. Um, how much time do I have, Sakanya? I think I have like five minutes roughly. So let me go ahead and show this in action because it is exciting. Uh, I was hoping to show this live on a demo, but let me get into it. So. Real quick, in this demo I've recorded here, um, all I've done is deployed a service fabric managed cluster, two node types, node type one, node type two. This will be clearly outlined in documentation that we'll be publishing, but all you do is specify a cluster name, at least one method to go about this, a cluster name and a node type two name where you're gonna apply auto scale against. I have a template because we like to see code and Charles sets us up nicely, but I have a JSON here that I actually deployed to this cluster. It's basically a one pager here. So you can see at the top, the only two parameters I have to define is exactly what I just explained. And then I have auto scale set to true here. And then there's a set of parameters I'm defining, which if you've ever done auto scale, this should look really familiar. It's normal auto scale settings under the Microsoft Insights provider. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna be quick about this, but I just wanna get this out quickly. So in this demo, I've deployed those and it's disabled, so I'm just following up with enabling it. So I'm just toggling that flag from false to true. And this takes anywhere from about 10 to 30 seconds. Um, so it's really pretty quick. If you need to enable, modify, or disable, um, you should see it take no longer than 30 seconds. Um, because it's a video, I can skip ahead. But you can see here now the enable auto scale it value is true. And what I'm showing here is the node type, node type two was set to three, and all of a sudden it's updating to five, and that was triggered by auto scale. Um, as I'm highlighting there, and then what happens is you get a nice clean view of who is initiating this and the activity log. So you see I'm highlighting right there the auto scale up initiated, and going from three to five. It is that simple. It is that fast. Uh, we generally are seeing scale up take between five to nine minutes right now. Um, if you've ever done auto scale on classic, um, you'd be used to seeing it take 20 to 30 minutes. So that in itself is a huge improvement. Um, so I do want to highlight that. I think it's wonderful. Um, I will stop this live demo for now just to sake of time. And if you have any questions, I'll try to take them offline in chat, but let me move on. So what's planned to come up next? So we have a long list of things coming up um, in service fabric managed clusters. And so in particular, um, ease of deployment space. So we are going to support multiple managed disks. Um, there have been some people, some customers asking for multiple managed disks for data disk options. We will be supporting that. You will also be able to specify the drive letters as uh, for those additional data disks. We will also support the ability to specify the data disk letter for the, man the default managed disk that SFMC creates. Um, we are going to enable something on the back end. This will not be customer configurable, but I do want to highlight it because it's something um, Azure likes to promote. Um, we are going to be doing over provisioning on the scale sets by default. Um, this should further enhance the reliability of spinning up clusters and the speed at which we get the nodes spun up. So essentially that's what you should see as a customer. End to end time should improve and reliability should improve. Uh, we are going to be adding support for accelerated networking. Um, and so there's a long list. I'm trying not to just, I'll read pretty quick. Internal only load balancer support. I know Whit, you've been talking to us about this in particular and some other customers. Um, so we are going to be removing the need to specifically configure an additional external load balancer. So cheers here. Uh, additional managed disk encryption option. We're gonna support encryption at host. 
Um, this is an alternative to disk level encryption. This is something that is done at the host level versus the VM level. Doesn't require uh, a VM level CPU usage and enables full end to end encryption. Um, ability to toggle IPv6 on and off per subnet. Um, we've had some scenarios come in where a particular subnet managed cluster, the customer does not want IPv6 enabled on, but they want an IPv6 enabled elsewhere or in other subnets in that cluster. Um, so we're allowing, starting to allow more granularity and control. Um, private link service, and we'll get into too in depth here. I will touch on these more uh, in the next community call, more in depth. Um, something we're calling auxiliary subnets. So this is in support of enabling scenarios like private link service, where we're just going to essentially have a, a, I'll say a, I'd say dummy subnet, but basically an empty subnet that will just hang out there where we can attach services to. Um, and then the Traffic 2.5 preview. I do want to highlight this. This is not specific to SFMC. Um, I just don't have a good place to fit in, fit this in right now. I will link that into the chat, um, but it is available now for testing via GitHub. Um, so our the GitHub um, instructions do walk you through using SFMC as an example. Um, so that's why I have it under this umbrella. But I do want to highlight that. So again, I'll just finish. Hopefully I'm quick enough here, Sakanya. I just want to finish. Again, call to action. Please continue filing um, issues or feature requests. Um, we're getting them through multiple channels. I am trying to get back to everybody, and we are listening. So that's it. I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Mike. That was helpful and really fast. Appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, um, and I know we don't have too much of time, but I just want to uh, for quick Q and A's, and we will definitely uh, make sure we uh, schedule more time next time around for Q and A's. But I do want to follow up on a couple of items from last time around. There was a feedback about um, you know some of the assemblies being uh, dependent on ASP.NET 1.0. We took that feedback. We're working on it right now. Just wanted to follow up and give an update that uh, um, the 8.2 release will kind of see a change in that aspect. We are kind of now going to make it dependent on um, .NET 3.1, so that's coming up. Uh, there were a couple of other items that came back as a feedback. Um, we're still working uh, through those and hopefully either in the upcoming release um, or at least we will have an update for you the next time around. Um, there was uh, also a feedback about the um, the link which uh, where you can provide questions is uh, was broken. I think um, Cesar fixed that. So thanks Cesar for taking care of that. Um, and I am look. We are looking through some of the um, the uh, questions that you posted there. I will try to summarize. I know we're going to be out of time soon, um, but I will try to summarize a response before the next um, tech community call, and we sh we will definitely have an update for you for all of those. Um, and I see a lot of questions posted uh, right now in this chat. Uh, we have about four minutes for another Q&A, so I'm going to open it up. Uh, please feel free to unmute and ask the questions. Otherwise, we'll just reply back on the chat. Yeah, I see at least one from uh, Andy there. If we could answer out loud for the recording. It says, um, is there any way to sell a SF application with multiple services that relies on Azure resources on Azure Marketplace? I'm not sure I completely understand the question. So, um, can uh, Mike, do you know? I do not know. Is there a way to sell? I don't know. I'll follow up on that one. Yeah. Andy, feel free to unmute and clarify if anything. Otherwise, yeah, folks can follow up afterwards as well. But um, is there any clarifications you can make there? Um, yeah, we've got a, a product that we're developing that relies on um on azure resources and we're wondering about the process to to be able to monetize that on azure marketplace yeah i don't think i know the answer to that andy but i'm going to follow up on it um hopefully we'll have an answer for you next time around okay thank you Problem. anyone else um, go ahead. Things in just um, if, if anybody's involved with uh, the Azure DevOps side of things, 
Um, I was trying to get an update for the deployment task to be able to use service principle authentication, but I wasn't getting any response on uh, on the GitHub page. So I don't know if anybody has ever helped with that. Um, thanks, Andrea. I'm just taking a quick look at the link. Um, yeah, I don't think it's been tagged or assigned to anybody. Let me follow up on that and figure out who's the right person to assign it to. OK, um, and then Wit had a question about bring your own um, VNet. I'm assuming that's essentially what you're asking. Uh, should I create a NSG for the primary node uh, type subnet or is one created as part of the provisioning process? So Mike, do you, do you want to oh, take that one? Should be the latter. Wit, uh, but I do want to learn more about your experience there. And if you want to also frame in a way what experience you expect or desire, that also would help. Uh, I, I guess I, I shared a big old thing about that yeah, on, on Yammer for you the other day. <laughs> I, I, but, yeah. yeah, so I guess largely it's very experimental today, right? <laughs> um, it's preview, it, yeah. Yeah, for for sure, for yeah. sure. So I, I guess, yeah, so it, it, if if one is created for me, uh, I guess how, how do I for for all the managed resources, are they visible in the Azure portal? So if if I, you know, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is to configure them, do I have to create ARM templates to make changes, or can I just kind of click into them? So the path we want folks to take is use the Service Fabric Managed Resource Provider to configure the NSG rules. Okay. The if you bypass that, while technically feasible, uh, it can create you know, problems. I'll, I'll summarize it that way. Sure. Uh, because if the provider doesn't know about it or you create a rule in the wrong um, numbered range, right? Like where we reserve, you know, 300, right? One to 300, mm -hmm. um, it can create a lot of conflict. So if there's problems with that model, please let me know. Um, but yeah, the intention is, and we just had a similar question from another customer today, like, you know, can I pull it in if you're assigning your own VNet or bring your own VNet and you have an existing rule set and then SG established because that's what my security team requires, for instance, mm -hmm. how do we integrate that cleaner <laughs> without forcing yeah. someone to go recreate everything from scratch from SFMC? So um, I hope that kind of, yeah. I mean, especially for my side, yeah, I, I've got some subnets that you know access uh, Azure services and you know others mm. that you know shouldn't, and mm. so just different rules for different subnets uh, historically applied to separate node types. So it's trying to figure out how to kind of migrate that into this. Okay, and if I would reframe it as a, I'll say a user story if it helps. You know, yeah. as a user, I would like to provide a subnet and existing NSG rule set that you would integrate into SFMC. Yes. So the subnet part we got handled, the SG part we need more work for on. for each node type. For each node type, yeah. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Um, thank you everyone. And um, thank you again, Charles and Mike, for joining in and uh, for doing the demos. Um, so I think that's pretty much all we have time for for today, um, but we'll try to make sure we circle back to all your questions and uh, you know feedback provided through the link and we will have some time uh, and make a clear presentation with the responses uh, next time around. Um, hopefully that should help answer um, all your questions. We hope to see you all back uh, for the next session. Thank you again for joining in. Cesar, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah, perfect. Just to wrap things up, folks, uh, two things, uh, both links in the chat. One is to share your ideas for the next call. Uh, and definitely what else you want to hear about from the Service Fabric team. And then also share your feedback on this particular session. Let us know how it went or what you want to hear more about through that link as well um, across any Azure product or service from the community. With that, folks, thanks for joining live. Thanks, team, for, for today's talk. Um, and we'll, we'll see you in the next one uh, in about a month here. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, team. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.